Thank you, Seth, and good morning. Good to be with you all. We are in the book of Joshua, and we are in chapter 9. These are rather long chapters, so rather than read the entire chapter, I'm going to read just part of, of this one, as I have been doing. Uh, I'm going to look at verses 1 through 16, which gives us the the main force of the uh, text uh, that we will cover this morning. We're going to look at the entire chapter 1 through 27, but I'll just read beginning with verse 1 through verse 16. Now, you remember, they, uh, Israel has fought two battles with the city of Ai, a very small town. But there was sin in the camp because Achan stole treasures from the city of Jericho, which was under the ban. It was all dedicated to God. It was like the first fruits of the conquest, and it was to be given to him, and he stole. So that sin was exposed by the fact that they lost this battle to a very, very small town. But they came back, they dealt with the sin, they resumed the conquest, they conquered the city of Ai, and then they went up to Shechem, which is in the center part of Israel, and rededicated themselves to the covenant, reading the law uh, uh, on the two mountains of Mount uh, Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Now we begin chapter 9, which begins, Now it came about when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland and on all the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard of it, heard of the conquest of Ai, but maybe also I think context might indicate the defeat that Israel suffered at the hands of Ai that they gathered themselves together with one accord to fight with Joshua and with Israel. When the inhabitants of, inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they also acted craftily and set out as envoys and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and wineskins worn out and torn and mended, and worn out and patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and had become crumbled. They went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. The men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you are living within our land. How then shall we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. Then Joshua said to them, Who are you and where do you come from? They said to him, Your servants have come from a very far country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. So our leaders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions in your hand for the journey, and go meet them, and say to them, We are your servants. Now then... Make a covenant with us. This, our bread, was warm when we took it for our provisions out of our houses on the day that we left to come to you. But now behold, it is dry and has become crumbled. These wineskins which we filled were new, and behold, they are torn. And these, our clothes and our sandals, are worn out because of the very long journey. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. 
Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the, of the congregation swore an oath to them. It came about at the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were neighbors and that they were living within their land. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. The Bible gives us strict warnings about getting entangled with the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, for example, it says, Do not love the world nor the things of the world. In James chapter 4, verse 4 is very strong. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Friend of the world is an enemy of God. The point, of course, is not don't be kind or helpful to unbelievers or withdraw from the world. The point is, don't get entangled in the world. Adopt its spirit and ways and seek its goals. It reminds me of some famous advice George Washington gave the government at the end of his second term as president when he wrote his farewell address. He warned against permanent foreign alliances, long-term treaties, such entanglements result in unintended consequences like involvement in unnecessary wars on foreign fields. His language is severe. He said other nations don't have our interests at heart. They practice the arts of seduction. And nations in such alliances are in some degree a slave. Now, if that's true of one nation in alliance with another, it's certainly true of the church adopting the principles of the world or a Christian becoming entangled with a non-Christian. Paul warned of that, of being unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? But it can happen, happen to the best and the wisest of us, because like nations, the world around us does, to use Washington's words, practice the arts of seduction, which is deception. Joshua chapter 9 gives a good example of that very thing. When good men, godly men, got trapped in a treaty with unbelievers because they were careless. It's a warning to us. That's the lesson. But not the only lesson. Because often where men fail, God blesses. That's the greatness of grace. It's Psalm 76 verse 10. God makes the wrath of man to praise him. He brings blessing out of transgression. Still, transgression is sin. It is wickedness, and its effects are wide. We see that at the beginning of the, the chapter, when the kings of Canaan made a treaty and gathered to fight Joshua. Now what happened? Earlier at the beginning of chapter 5, the kings heard how Israel had crossed the Jordan and entered Canaan and their hearts melted. Now they're emboldened. What happened is chapter 7. Achan sinned, and I, little I, insignificant I, defeated Israel. Now the vaunted Israelite army no longer seemed invulnerable, and the enemy was inspired to fight. That was the effect of one man's sin on the nation. It lost a battle. The Canaanite kings formed an alliance. And now what might have been an easy conquest would face stiff resistance. 
Now, I mentioned Psalm 76 and how God in, in His sovereign wisdom causes the rebellion of man to serve His own purpose and, his, and, and, and serve it to His praise. And this coalition of kings would result in the collapse of that coalition and the colossal defeat of, of Canaan. But still, our failure only encourages the world in its rejection of our message and its opposition to the gospel. And here, it, it strengthened resistance to Israel. But not all were resolved to resist. Verse 3 states, When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, well, we learn that they resolved to sue for peace. What we learn later is they had access to the revelation of the Lord. That seems to be the clear suggestion of, uh, or statement of verse 24 later in the chapter. They had learned that the Lord had given Canaan to Israel, and all the inhabitants of the land were to be destroyed. They'd been told about Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 16 through 18. They were to, Israel was to utterly destroy them, so that they may not teach you to do according to all the detestable things in their pagan religion and pagan culture. Now, that's the reason for the curse on Canaan. It's first of all, their guilt. We've covered that to some degree. Their heinous sin that only increased. And by now, 500 years after God had talked to Abraham about giving the land to his descendants, the iniquity of the Amorite was full. And so their guilt is the fundamental reason for this judgment coming. But also, sin is infectious and lethal. Israel would be contaminated by Canaanite culture and its ways, so they needed to remove it, excise it from the land. That was Moses' instruction. That's a lesson for us. Not destroy sinners, but destroy sin. It's Romans 8, verses 12 and 13. Don't, don't indulge the flesh, but by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body. If we do that, we will live, Paul said. Now the Canaanites living in Gibeon heard this and believed it. Much like Rahab. Israel rolled up victories against powerful kings on the east side of the Jordan and then on the west side, defeated Jericho and Ai. They knew they couldn't beat this army and its God, so they decided to join them. Not by repentance, as Rahab had done, but by a ruse. They would trick Israel into making a treaty with them. They planned it out carefully, and they went to elaborate lengths to carry it off. Gibeon was about five miles northwest of Jerusalem and not far from Ai. In fact, you can, I visited the ruins of that site many years ago. There are still some things left of uh, the ancient city of Gibeon. But it was not far from Jerusalem and not far at all from the town of Ai. It, it wasn't a weak city was in a small city. In fact, in chapter 10, it's described as a great city, like one of the royal cities. It was greater than I, and its men were mighty. Still, the fiery destruction of its neighbors set it on this course of action. They acted craftily, verse 4 says. They pretended to be a delegation from a foreign country far away outside Canaan. And to give the lie the appearance of truth, they dressed the part. They wore old patched sandals, carried worn out cracked wine bottles and bread that was dry and crumbling. Verse 6, they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. 
Again, it's clear from that that they had knowledge of Moses' instruction in Deuteronomy 20 about destroying the inhabitants of Canaan. In fact, earlier in Deuteronomy 20, Moses said that cities not of Canaan, cities far off, would be treated differently. They would be given the opportunity to make peace and serve Israel. So the Gibeonites make sure to tell Joshua that they weren't from around these parts. They were from a place far off, using the same word that uh, Moses used, a far off country. That's how the enemy works. He dissembles or deceives by wrapping himself in truth and all of the right words all of the right language. And these Gibeonites came disguising themselves as qualifying for a peace treaty. Joshua and the, uh, the men of Israel were taken in by it. Now they were initially skeptical and they asked some questions. Verse 7, perhaps you are living within our land, they said. No, they, they answered, we are your servants. Now that's interesting as well. Moses said in Deuteronomy 20 that if people, if qualified for this, if they were, they were from far away and accepted the terms of peace, that they would be Israel's servants. That's how they refer to themselves. So Joshua asked them who they were and where they were from. They answered by repeating that they had come from a distant place, a very far country. And they came for the best reason, because of the fame of the Lord your God. Well, that had to be appealing to Joshua and the leaders of Israel. They, they were there because of the Lord, out of devotion to Him. They, they were men of faith, or at least they were seekers. That's good. They had heard what the Lord had done in Egypt, and what he had done on the east side of the Jordan to the Amorite king, Sion and Og. Now that was very clever and showed how well thought out their ruse was. They didn't mention Jericho or Ai, which happened too recently and would have shown that they had not traveled very far or for very long. They knew what to say. And to give tangible proof to support what they said, they pulled out their bread, which was old, showing their cracked wine skins and uh, worn out sandals, all proof of their long journey. It all made sense to Joshua and the leaders. And, and so in verse 15, we read that they made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of Israel swore an oath now, it's hard not to have some admiration for the Gibeonites. They were clever, and they didn't side with the other Canaanites. And you feel a little sympathy for the Israelites. They, they acted in good faith. They were deceived. And still, the Bible doesn't praise the Gibeonites, nor does it sympathize with the Israelites. Verse 14 makes it clear that Israel was without excuse. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions, that is, they examined these things, the bread and the wine bottles, and, and they did not ask for the Lord, for the counsel of the Lord. They made their decision according to what they could see, what they could touch, <clears throat> they handled the bread, and it crumbled in their hands, so they used their own judgment, and based on their senses, entered into a covenant. What they didn't do was seek the Lord. And that had... They had the means to do that, I should say, with uh, what's not mentioned here, but we know from, from the... Uh, 
the books of Moses, they had the Urim and the Thummim, which were instruments that the priest had, the high priest, and was used for a purpose such as this, to find out the Lord's will, gaining understanding, gaining divine direction. Well, they didn't appeal to that. They didn't feel they needed to, evidently. They were satisfied with the judgments that they had reached with their own senses, with their eyes and with their hands, seeing and touching. It seemed to confirm all that they needed. And so they didn't think they needed to appeal to the Lord. They didn't need to seek His guidance in that way. Or perhaps they just didn't think to do it. You know, there are basically two types of sin. You have heard this, I'm sure. There are sins of commission and sins of omission. Doing something that we shouldn't do, which is commission, committing a sin, and then doing, not doing something that we should do, omitting it. Sins of omission. Well, whatever one this was, it was a serious lapse in judgment, similar to the one that occurred before the first battle of Ai, when they didn't seek the Lord's guidance. Now here they were more circumspect, they looked into it more than they did in that previous era. They'd learned something, but still, they made the mistake of following their senses, following their own judgment. The city uh, was small, thinking of I when they were dealing with that. It, it would be easy to defeat. They didn't need to look to the Lord. And here too, it, it all seemed so obvious with all these provisions that they had and they could examine. Now the cases between the two, I and Gibeon, were different. One was a decision regarding war. The other was a decision about peace. But with both, there was something secret that was hidden from them, which only the Lord could reveal. That's why we must never trust in ourselves. Never trust our senses and, and judgment and must always be people of prayer, looking to the Lord to give us wisdom and guidance and, and not lean on our own understanding. Well, that's the counsel we have from the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. That describes a way of life. Not sporadic moments of, of seeking God's will. It is a life of study and prayer, of walking by the Spirit, of obedience. It is a careful life, not a careless life. It is a way of life. As we study, He gives understanding and He imparts wisdom through the, that, that understanding. And, uh, and so, as we gain the wisdom of God through the study of His Word and through fellowship with Him in prayer, we know what to do in various circumstances. And He makes our path straight by His providence. Now that Joshua and, and the leaders were godly men. They're earnest believers, and we see that in this passage, which really makes the, uh, the warning of it all the more uh, important for us. These were earnest believers, godly men, but they had a lapse, and it happens with the best. They were not trusting in the Lord. They were not seeking His counsel. They didn't feel that they needed to, evidently, or they just neglected to, and the result was a grave mistake. So we ask ourselves, how do such things happen? How did it happen with them exactly? I suppose there are different reasons for that, but we ask that of ourselves individually. We can ask that of, of a, a, a church. How does it become aligned with people and positions that are contrary to their beliefs and biblical practice? It's another way of saying, how do we become worldly? It's all very subtle. We don't embrace Christ and begin living for Him, growing in our faith, and then wake up one morning and decide, you yeah, know, I think I'll be friends with the world. 
It happens slowly. As I said, subtly. We take our eyes off Christ and begin to drift. The, the world looks good. It has an appeal. It seems real. It's what we can have now. We don't have to wait. The world really exerts a kind of artful pressure on us that is constant and eventually insinuates itself into our minds. It's, it's what Paul warns of in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, about being conformed to this world. I know Mark was speaking along these same lines in the previous hour, and how it's so hard to to not keep our minds on the things of daily life around us and get caught up in that. And we're to look for the Lord's return, be praying for that. Do we pray for that? He asked that question, and I have asked that question of myself. Oftentimes, no, that's not what my mind is on. It's on the things of this world, the daily things. And the world, let's face it, is, um, is attractive. It's it's pretty neat. It's cool. It's what I wanted when I was 17. To be Steve McQueen, the king of cool, sailing over barbed wire on a motorcycle, driving fast sports cars. That's what I wanted. I didn't know about the fruit of the Spirit back then. That's wasn't what I was striving for. It was for other things. It was to have that intangible something. Well, we grow out of that into something more sophisticated with age, but it's really all the same, and it is all a mirage. It's all about self-interest and self-advancement for something that is not real. It's what Satan offered Jesus when he took him up on the mountaintop and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, showed them to him in all of its splendor, and he said, it's yours, just worship me. It was a compromise. Christ saw through it and rejected it. It was a temptation to him, though. How much? It's, it's hard for us to say, but I can say this. It was, as, it, was, it was a great temptation. It was Satan at his most artful. And he presented this glorious world to Christ and said, you can have it all right now. He rejected it. He saw through it. B.B. Warfield wrote about this in his um, article imitating the incarnation of, of self-assertion, of conquest, as he called it, in gaining a place for ourselves, of a, of a position. Conquest of the admiration of man. He wrote of the fierce battle of men and women for leading parts in the farce of social display. That's well put. The farce of social display. That's the world. That's what people are after. What it offers. But what it offers is a farce. It's a charade. But a very convincing one. Even for the born again. The only way to counter the appeal of the world is with something more appealing. And that, for the believer, is Jesus Christ. It's Him in His perfection as the Savior, as the God-man. He is altogether glorious. Now, it takes time. To cultivate that. But that's what we must be doing. It, it, is a, it is a lifelong thing that we do as we seek to know Him and daily spend time with Him, studying Him, praying to Him, to our triune God. And that cultivates this relationship. And, and so as we have that relationship, we must keep our eyes on Him. That's how we live the life. That's what the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. That's how we run the race of faith, which is for us the race of life. It's how we live successfully in this world, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And as we keep our eyes on Him, we learn more about Him, and we grow in our appreciation for Him. And as that fills our hearts and that fills our mind, these other things become less significant to us. We see through it. 
So we have to fill our minds with Him and His Word. We, we stumble when we don't. We become friends with the world, compromise our behavior, or, or the church compromises its message. It's dangerous. We live in a dangerous world. Israel put itself in that position. It made an unholy alliance. It was a sin of omission. They neglected to consult the Lord. They trusted their senses, themselves, and they were duped. They, they were genuinely deceived. It, as I said, it happens. But the deception was not for long. It never is. Proverbs 12, verse 19 says that a lying tongue is only for a moment. It becomes known. And within three days, Israel learned the truth. People became angry with their leaders and they grumbled against them because they, they'd made a covenant with the enemy. They'd let the enemy in. They, they were, knew that they were now threatened. They were weakened as a nation. And they wanted to go march on Gibeon and kill all the people there. But the leaders were determined to let the Gibeonites live because of the oath they had sworn. Verse 19. But all the leaders said to the whole congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. This we will do to them, even let them live, so that wrath will not be upon us for the oath which we swore to them. They understood admirably and correctly that a vow is important. It is binding. A man's word should be good for something. In business and in marriage. And I would say most importantly in marriage. When a couple is joined in marriage, they make a vow. They make a vow to one another and they make that vow also to God. Sometimes the match is not a good one. Maybe it's based on personalities or physical attraction and wasn't spiritually grounded. Still, the couple entered into marriage and the vow is sacred. Israel failed badly. But to their credit, the leaders understood the importance of an oath. They knew that if they violated it, they would dishonor God and they would bring down His wrath on themselves. That actually happened 400 years later when Saul violated the agreement with the Gibeonites and as punishment, men of his house were put to death. This generation, Joshua and the leaders of Israel, was a, was a godly generation, unlike their parents who grumbled in the desert and wanted to forsake what they had been given by God and go back to Egypt. Now this was a, a, a faithful generation, but they failed as the best of people do. Nevertheless, they were determined not to add to their sin. So they let the Gibeonites live, but they also applied the law to them. Deuteronomy 20, verse 11, which the Gibeonites evidently knew, stated that those who make peace will become Israel's servants. They will become forced labor. Joshua made them servants. You are cursed, he said, and you shall never cease being slaves. For the rest of their days, they would be woodcutters and water carriers for Israel at the tabernacle. Gibeonites didn't protest like, like Cain who whined, my punishment is too great to bear. Well, they acknowledged their guilt and they accepted the service as just. They were realists and they had spiritual insight. They knew God had given Israel the land. Therefore, they said, we feared greatly for our lives because of you and have done this thing. But they added in verse 25, Now behold, we are in your hands. Do as it seems good and right in your sight to us. 
And the chapter concludes, Thus he did to them and delivered them from the hands of the sons of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place which he would choose. The main lesson of chapter 9 is is one of caution. Be vigilant. It's an exhortation found throughout the Bible. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Peter writes, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Probably nothing in the Bible other than the cross of Christ seems more foolish to modern man than the notion of a a personal devil. Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub. And that's just the way he wants it. Living under the radar, undetected. What he does is infiltrate the uh, the church and, and compromise the gospel by means of deception getting into an alliance with the church. Paul warns of that in in 2 Corinthians 11, of false apostles and deceitful workers. He wrote, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. A seeker. Someone who's here because of the Lord. Be sober of spirit, Peter said. Be on the alert. Well, Joshua Joshua was sober after I, but still got fooled. That's a warning to us. I don't think they were casual about sin at this point. But nevertheless, these men were clever and they were fooled. That's how effective the enemy is. It's, It's the reason Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 16, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Christians of all people should understand the nature of this fallen world. Understand the wiles of the devil and deceitfulness of the human heart. We need to know that. We need to understand human nature and the nature of the world and be wise. In fact, the Lord exposed the, our failure in Luke chapter 16, verse 8, when He said, The sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. They understand the way the world works better than we do. Well, the way to re- remedy that, the way to get wisdom, is to know God's Word. Go back to what I said earlier about filling our minds with Christ, and who He is and what He's done. But all of the Word of God, the Scriptures, God's revelation, Israel failed a second time to look to the Lord and seek His guidance. We have that from the Scriptures. We have it from the Bible and the the Holy Spirit who is our interpreter. All that being said, and, and the warnings here are very pointed and insightful and serious. Still, all of that being said, there's some encouragement here as well, at least by implication. The the seriousness with which the leaders of Israel took their oath showed their devotion to the Lord, as I pointed out. Because they knew He takes His promises seriously, that they are inviolable, they understood that they must also take their oaths and their promises seriously. But seeing that in them as a reflection of their understanding of the Lord, it's very significant. Francis Schaeffer made this observation. If God will not tolerate the breaking of an oath made in His name, how much more will He never break His own oath and covenant made to us on the basis of His shed blood and infinite value of Jesus Christ? And that reminds us that we are secure in Christ. Even when we fail, we are secure in Christ. The the author of Hebrews gave that assurance in Hebrews chapter 6. Verses 13 through 20, where he said that God made promises, 
interposed by an oath, and he adds, it is impossible for God to lie. Can't break his promises. He can't break his oath. He can't violate it. We fail in the Christian life. We stumble and sin and, and have to bear the consequences of that. Both Israel and the Gibeonites suffered consequences for what happened. Nevertheless, God is always with us, like a, like a father holding his, his child's hand when the child's learning to walk. You parents no doubt did that. We all did that with our children. We'd take their hand and we'd, we'd walk with them and they'd, they're just learning to get their balance and they'd stumble and we'd hold them and raise them up. Well, that's what the Lord does with us. He walks with us constantly. We stumble, we fall. He's patient. He lifts us up. He continues on with us, teaching us, helping us to walk even more surely and correctly. That's the Christian life. That's, that's the Lord teaching us to walk, training us in this Christian life, and never forsaking us because He is bound by oath to His elect, and He will never let them go. His grace is greater than our sin. In fact, Paul said, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And it did with those Gibeonites. They were made to work in the tabernacle. Now what greater blessing could be given to pagans than that? To, to see the altar and sacrifices, to be in the light of God's worship and truth. This was better than had they been left alone and left to flourish as pagans in Gibeon without any interference from, from Joshua and, and the army of Israel. To be servants of Israel and to be in that place was a rich blessing. When the nation was divided up, the city of Gibeon was given to the line of Aaron. 400 years later, David put the tabernacle there. One of David's mighty men was a Gibeonite, Ishmaiah. And it was at Gibeon that Solomon had his, his famous dream when he asked for wisdom at the beginning of his reign, 1 Kings chapter 3. Some of the Gibeonites are listed in the book of Nehemiah. It, it seems the Gibeonites were fully assimilated among the Jews, like Rahab was, converts. And perhaps a picture of the Gentiles by grace being grafted into Israel's olive tree in Romans 11, verse 17. Sin has consequences. The Gibeonites had to labor in a menial task all their lives. But where God forgives, He turns a curse into a blessing. He did that with the Gibeonites and does that with all who trust in Him, trusting by trusting in Christ, He begins where we are. He takes sinful, fallen people and recreates them. He heals the brokenhearted. He makes us useful for Him. That's the, the first product of regeneration, of being born again. We become new creatures in Christ then we begin the, the process of sanctification. It happens immediately with regeneration of being conformed to the image of Christ. Even when we stumble, the Lord holds on to us, holds our hand, picks us up, and through obedience He leads us from strength to strength, from glory to glory until we reach the goal. And we will all reach the goal. That's sovereign grace. That's the grace of our Lord. If you've not experienced that, it's offered in the gospel, the good news of eternal life through faith in Christ, God's Son and our Savior. He died to remove our sins. We have that forgiveness. We have it completely. We have it fully. We have it at the moment of faith. 
Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you've not believed in him, trust in him, come to him. He receives all who do and he will transform you and be with you until you enter into glory itself. May God help all of us to take courage in that and live a faithful life. Let's bow in a word of prayer and I'll give thanks for the bread and the wine that we will take. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We see it in our lives continually. We, even when we don't see it, it's a present reality. We are in Christ. We are never outside of Christ. And your care for us is constant. Even when we stumble and fall, you are with us and you raise us up and you deal with us and enable us to recover and progress. And we can even see ourselves in these Gibeonites um, who really, in the, in the end of it all, were greatly blessed. And you took a, a ruse and you turned it into repentance in the lives of many of them and brought them, it would seem, to yourself and, and uh, blessed them greatly. And that's us, Father. We are undeserving, but you've blessed us through your grace, which brought us to saving knowledge of Christ. And now, Lord, as we turn our attention to this supper, we pray that you would prepare our hearts for that and bless us as we take it. We thank you for Christ and what he did for us, for his death on our behalf, his great sacrifice for our sin. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As we continue to prepare our hearts for the observance of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to read a short passage out of Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse 24. You might want to follow along. It's really a very deep passage theologically and full of insight into the relationship between the Old Testament uh, priestly and sacrificial rituals and Christ's sacrificial work on the cross which fulfilled them. The author of Hebrews, in one sense, is explaining how the two relate. Uh, one is earthly and symbolic. The other is real. One is the shadow. The other is the substance. But uh, this is not the time to really elaborate on that in any way. So I'm simply going to read these verses. They all relate to the Lord's Supper. But I want to make special note of an aspect of the last verse that points to the future. So Hebrews 9, 24. Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation, without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. Well, I said the passage directly relates to the Lord's Supper, uh, that's because the central truth taught here in the 26th verse is that in fulfillment of these Old Testament images and, and practices, the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, appeared. Uh, he took on human flesh and he came and he dwelt among us for the very purpose that he might put away sin by the sacrifice 
of himself. And that's what the bread and the wine represent, Christ's body uh, given for us. And the cup of the new covenant uh, in his blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But it's not solely about what Christ has done for us in the past. And that's indicated in this final verse 28 that the Lord, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation to those who eagerly wait for him. We do eagerly wait for him, and one of the ways we do that is by observing this supper. As the, for as the Apostle Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians 11, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we partake today collectively uh, as his body. Uh, we unite our hearts to say, come Lord Jesus, O oh, Lord come. And we invite all of you who are here this morning with us or watching live stream, if you have trusted in Christ and that is the prayer of your heart, come Lord Jesus to participate now with us in his supper. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you for this bread, which is a symbol of the life you gave as a substitute for sinners. And each of us individually now who know you and have received that forgiveness of sins because of your work on the Christ, on the cross, we say to you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. In this passage, the author shows the superiority of the sacrifice of Christ to that compared to the sacrifices of the priests of Aaron. There were many priests of Aaron who offered many sacrifices and offerings over the centuries, and they had a purpose. Mark mentioned the tabernacle and the things of the Old Covenant were a, a shadow of the things to come, and that is true of the sacrifices of Aaron and what he offered at the tabernacle. They offered at the tabernacle. But they didn't take away sin. Christ's sacrifice did. Took away sins forever. And in verse 11 we read, <clears throat> Every priest stands daily ministering, and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for the time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. The word sanctified describes the entire Christian experience from regeneration to glorification, from the, the new birth and faith to our resurrection. And in the present time, that's how God sees us. Those who have been perfected by Christ. He sees us whole and complete. He sees us clean and complete. We are sanctified. And Christ did all of that through His substitutionary sacrifice for us. He did it all, as the author puts it, for all time. There's no time when we're not perfect in the eyes of God and completely accepted by Him. The work of salvation is finished and it's indicated that. Christ showed that when he sat down, as the author said, at the right hand of his Father. He sat down because the work is finished. There's nothing we can add to it. We can only receive it. And having received it, work and serve him with gratitude. Not to gain anything. We've gained it all. But to serve him out of love for him, for the love he showed us. Let's give thanks for the sacrifice He made for us. Father, we do thank You for this cup that speaks of the, of the sacrifice. It speaks of the blood that was shed to make the payment for our sins. And it was made complete 
perfect and perfected us for all time. And now your son is seated at your right hand and he'll come back again as we've been reminded. And he will reign this or over this earth. Not come back because of sin, because he's paid for that. And we have the hope of that before us. Increasingly make that our hope, Father. We thank you for him and his death, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Keep looking to Christ, the author and perfecter of faith, and hopefully we will see you next week.